A record 41 million people forced from their homes. And the number of displaced from conflicts and natural disasters will continue to rise. So why is the world ignoring their plight? And who should be responsible for protecting them? This is Inside Story. And welcome to the programme. I'm Hala Mahiyadeen. Now, every day, thousands of people risk their lives by crossing borders to escape wars and natural disasters. But many more, forced from their homes, have no choice but to stay in their own countries. A record 41 million people were described as internally displaced last year, more than double the number of refugees. And increasingly, people are becoming homeless because of cyclones, floods and droughts, which are becoming more frequent because of climate change. Homera Chowdhury has the details. More people were forced from their homes by violence and natural disasters last year than ever before. The majority from 10 countries, with Syria and Colombia topping the list. And the Norwegian Refugee Council is warning the trend is likely to continue unless people are protected from new conflicts. World leaders are not sitting down and say, let us at least agree on one thing, shield the civilian population, avoid new conflicts like the ones we're seeing now in, in Libya, the escalation we've seen in Yemen again, the new conflict in Cameroon that we're doing nothing about. In 2018, there were 28 million new displacements. Ethiopia, Democratic Republic of Congo and Syria account for more than half that figure. Almost 11 million people were forced out by violence and conflict. But the majority of new cases, about 17 million, were because of natural disasters. The Philippines, China and India accounted for around 60%, mostly due to evacuations. The report shows it's an increasingly urban phenomenon. Conflicts in cities such as Dara in Syria, Hodeida in Yemen and Tripoli in Libya accounted for much of the internal displacement recorded in the Middle East. Many of those trying to escape the effects of climate change head to cities, including Taka in Bangladesh, which are already facing overcrowding problems. A recent World Bank report said more than 140 million people could be displaced by climate change by 2050. Europe is being told it needs to step up to the plate and play its part in tackling the global crisis. We were shocked that 250 people died crossing the Berlin Wall during a generation of Cold War. And now we seem to accept 2,500 or more people dying per year in the Mediterranean. Is it, it, again, it's a damning verdict of, of the so-called European civilization. We cannot have that happening. However, statistics show refugees or the displaced often go to nearby countries rather than Europe or the United States. Turkey, Pakistan, Uganda and Lebanon accept more of them. Millions of people just waiting for the chance to restart their lives. But every year there are more and more refugees and fewer places willing to take them in. Hamera Chowdhury, Al Jazeera, Inside Story. Well, let's bring in our guests from Geneva. We're joined by Alexandra Bilak, the director of the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, who led the team behind that report. From Paris, François Germain, professor of environmental geopolitics and migration dynamics at the Paris Institutes of Political Studies, and by Skype from Thessaloniki in Greece, Mariana Karakulaki, a journalist focusing on migration and the co-editor of the book, Critical Perspectives of Migration in the 21st Century. Thank you all for joining us. If I could uh, turn to you first, Alexandra Bilak. This report is staggering to many on first viewing. More than double the number of people uh, internally displaced than, than refugees. So why aren't we hearing more about this? Well, it's true. Um, we're shocked every year when we publish this report at how little attention internally displaced people continue to receive, particularly from the international community. Uh, and this year was, uh, was like every other year. We report high numbers. This is a record number of 41.3 million people living internally displaced because of conflict and violence. 
uh, across the world, predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. And yet, because there, this displacement is happening behind borders, uh, and often in areas that are difficult to access, uh, the international media hardly ever report on them, uh, and they remain invisible, not just to their own governments in some cases, but also to the international community. So we're talking about extremely vulnerable individuals who are not getting the protection and the assistance that they need. And as you said, on top of the conflict displacement that we report every year, we're also looking at millions of people every year that are forced out of their homes because of sudden and slow onset disasters. Um, so again, a phenomenon that is very much global in scope, that is growing in scale and in complexity, uh, and yet that is uh, receiving much less relatively of the attention both uh, in the media but also in the policy debates uh, currently ongoing. Uh, one of the interesting aspects that, that, that popped out for me in any case was the, was the environmental angle. Uh, François Germain, uh, the, were you surprised at all that more people appeared to be displaced by environmental factors than, than, than violence and security issues? Well, clearly this is not a surprise and this confirms what other reports and other studies have been showing for years, that uh, we tend to see people displaced by climate change and environmental disruption as a kind of distant and looming risk. The reality is that it's a clear and present crisis that needs to be addressed uh, right now. And as you were just saying with Alexandra in Geneva, um, industrialized countries tend to have a very autocentric view on migration. That is, that they feel that migration is of concern to them only if people cross their own borders. But the reality is that we should care about internal displacement as much as we do uh, for international displacement and migration, because these are not two distinct phenomena. And international displacement is often the continuation of internal displacement. This is not a series of local phenomena. We are dealing here with a global crisis that deserves attention right now. Mariana Karakulaki, you focus on migration. A lot of your work is to do with, the, the, the one might say, the end points when, when migrants leave countries and, and, and head into other ones. What was your reaction to this report when you saw it? I was quite surprised, to be honest, because uh... We have to keep in mind that uh, international displacement is the first step of migration. So what happens in the countries that people are in internally displaced uh, will affect uh, the receiving countries of migrants in the future. And we have seen this with the refugee crisis, that, the so-called refugee crisis that started in uh, 2015. Those who arrived in Europe were initially internally displaced in Syria, Iraq and other countries. Now, we, so, we had a statement from, uh, from Jan Egeland, the Secretary General of the Norwegian Refugee Companies. It was a very forceful reaction to this. He said, because these people haven't crossed the border, they receive pitiful global attention and millions are being failed uh, because of this, because of insufficient international diplomacy. But one could almost argue that even those who are crossing the borders are also dropping out of the attention. What would you say needs to... to would you agree with that, Alexandra Bilak, that, that because these people aren't crossing borders, this is not... Uh, this is not... We're not becoming aware of it, but also because... Uh, how do you say even those who are crossing borders are still dropping out of the public sphere? How do we start on tackling this? Well, it's true that, uh, I mean, a, a lot of the refugees and the very vulnerable migrants who have made their way or tried to make their way to Europe and to the United States over the last few years have received relatively more attention. But as Francois was saying, it's not always necessarily the right kind of attention. It's very much driven by everyone's anxiety at them arriving at our borders. But in relative terms, I think it is fair to say that IDPs across the world are generally much less spoken about because they are because this displacement is happening in uh, low, low-income countries, very fragile countries for the most part, uh, and that there's a tendency to think that the, the problem is better left at home. Um, but uh, what we're seeing, and I completely agree with, with what's already been said, that if unresolved internal displacement, leaving internal displacement uh, to happen behind these borders without giving it the attention that it deserves, will lead to cross-border flows and will lead to all sorts of other cyclical patterns of crisis, to insecurity. We see how difficult it is for IDPs to return to their homes of origin, and that, uh, that impossibility to reach solutions at home um, only perpetuates these cycles of crisis, of conflict, 
uh, and of, of, further, of further vulnerability that, that we see across the globe. So it, it is not a solution, it's not a response to, uh, to, uh, to not care and to not integrate internal displacement into global policy debates on displacement and migration. Let's take a look at the driving factors of this uh, because we are seeing this ramping up. It's already risen over a, a million over the past uh, year. Um, the report suggesting this is likely to keep going apace. What's driving this? Is it important to look at those factors first before we can uh, even think about coming up with a solution? Uh, François Germain, if you would weigh on on this, please. When we look at the latest report from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, uh, which says that uh, 28 million people were displaced last year uh, internally, uh, 10.8 million were displaced as a result of conflicts, 17.2 million were displaced as a result of disasters. And out of these 17 million, 16 were displaced as a result of weather-related disasters, that is, disasters that will be aggravated and exacerbated as a result of climate change. Uh, what we see today is that the factors are no longer separated from one another, but that climate change in particular is also having an effect on the economic and political drivers of displacement. For example, if one takes sub-Saharan Africa, about half of the households there depend directly on subsistence agriculture as the primary source of livelihood, which means that any change in the temperature or any change in the rainfall is directly affecting the economic resources of these families. And actually, those we call economic migrants coming to the shores of Europe, we might as well call them ecological or environmental migrants because the environment and the economy means the same thing for a lot of people in the world. If one looks at the conflicts in the Horn of Africa, again, we see that a lot of these conflicts are driven uh, by environmental conditions. Uh, competition for land, water scarcity, droughts. Uh, today, we are no longer like we were in the situation in the 1950s or 1960s, where we could categorize the people according to the drivers of their migration. Today, we saw these drivers being intermingled with each other and influencing each other considerably. Mariana Karakulaki. Well, as a result of climate change, which means that we need to... I beg your pardon, Francois. If I could just turn to, to, to you, Mariana, is this something that, you, no that, would, uh, uh, that, that would, would tally with your research, that the, the environmental uh, aspects are also driving in a way that perhaps security and violence was before? My research mainly focuses on Europe and in southern and eastern Mediterranean. So we haven't seen that large numbers of environmental migrants. We have seen uh, people who have been displaced due to conflict. Uh, however, what I found surprising in this uh, report was when I was reading about uh, uh, Afghanistan, um, half of those who were displaced, those who were internally displaced due to environmental reasons in Afghanistan, uh, the, are the same, pretty much the same numbers as those who were displaced because of conflict. So I think we will, uh, in, in the near future, we will keep seeing people who will uh, arrive in Europe due to environmental reasons. Because as I mentioned before, IDPs are the first, uh, inter internal displacement is the first step of migration. Right. Once, the, once the towns that have been, uh, that people were internally displaced start being affected, people will start to flee. So I think I haven't seen it that much uh, in my research right now, but it's something that will come up in the future, okay. in the areas that I focus. Th that's interesting you say that, that this is perhaps we're seeing, uh, we're seeing this as an opportunity to nip this in the buds. Would, would you agree with that, Alexandra Bilak, that we should be focusing more on climate and environmental factors when it comes to tackling both internal displacement and external migration? Well, I don't think it's necessarily a question of focusing more on climate and environmental factors than on, than on political and conflict-related ones. As, as uh, Mariana has even said just now, what, we, what we're seeing across the world is that both environmental and political factors are converging very much to cause very complex patterns of displacement and, for, and to drive these numbers up. So there needs to be much more investment both on the on the political side, many of the crises that we're seeing across the world are very much political crises that require political solutions. That means that there needs to be much more investment in, uh, in development, of course, because under development and income inequalities are at the, some of the root causes of these, of these problems. So investment on the development side, but also in peace building and conflict mediation 
uh, activities. And then, of course, that has to go hand in hand with much longer term uh, investments now and in the future into disaster risk reduction, preparedness, climate change adaptation, uh, urbanization and urban planning. Uh, one of the main trends of our report it shows that internal displacement is increasingly becoming an urban phenomenon. So investing really in the capacities of local governments to absorb these populations and to look at uh, solutions at the local level, at the level of municipalities, to find solutions so that they can be integrated into first perhaps the informal economy and, and then, then into a more formal process so that they can access jobs and employment and so that gradually we can actually start seeing those numbers coming down. So there needs to be investment on the response side to find solutions whether they're return or local integration and also significant investments in the prevention so that uh, so that we can prevent these, these, these flows from happening in the future. So whose responsibility is it to, to, to tackle this problem? As we're looking through the report, uh, it seems that a, a large chunk of these people uh, who are entirely displaced, uh, some two thirds, um, are coming from just a handful of countries. Is it down to these individual countries to tackle this? Or is there a, a wider role to be played? Francois Germain, your thoughts? But I think that it should be a global concern, uh, and we have a tendency to see these as local crises, uh, whereas it should be a global concern. Uh, industrialized countries like to say that migration is one of their top priorities, but the reality is that they're not interested in global migration dynamics until people come and cross their own borders. Uh, if we want really to address migration on a global scale, we need to pay more attention and more interest uh, in these local situations, and clearly, uh, given that a lot of the drivers leading to migration are also related to climate change, there is a huge responsibility from industrialized countries. We should not forget that a lot of these local crises are also the result of the actions uh, conducted by industrialized countries, be it through climate change or be it through geopolitics. And therefore, this should really be a global uh, responsibility. Uh, and clearly, industrialized countries cannot say that migration is the top priority if they don't pay attention to what's happening far away from their borders as well. But some of the, the many of the countries where migration is a, a, a specific problem and where it's uh, causing an, up, uh, an upswell of populist politics, I'm thinking particularly of Europe here, uh, groups will be arguing that there are problems at home that should be sorted first before we start uh, interfering in other people's countries. Do you think that... There is a will to tackle this. There, the, the, how, how do you see this pro progressing, Francois? Well, the problem is that we always wait until the last minute, until the situation becomes a crisis. And of course, uh, what really fuels the anxiety and the fear of people and also the populist vote is this rhetoric and this narrative about a crisis. And, and populist parties in Europe have clearly understood that they could play this to their own benefit and that the more they would describe migration as a crisis, the more people would be anxious about this and would vote for them. Uh, I think that we need to realize that migration can be managed and can be organized. But if we want to do that, we need to really look beyond our own borders and look at what's happening uh, in the countries of origin and in the countries of transit. If we don't do that, if we wait until the last minute, then of course it will become a crisis and then, of course, it will lead for more nationalist and populist policies. Uh, Mariana Karakulaki, you, your research has, has, has focused on these, uh, this migration of the 21st century at the later stage of the chain. Uh, and certainly, the, this has become more of an issue. It has become more of a talking point. Uh, and it is permeating national politics in many countries. Uh, do you see that uh, the, the road that we're on now, do you see there will ever be a will to tackle this at source? Or is this, uh, are, are we really coming to competing ideologies are coming against each other and there will be no will to tackle this? Um, I don't think there is a will to tackle it in, uh, in its source because this is what we've seen on the way that the European Union has managed the refugee crisis in, in Europe. Uh, they did not tackle the issue in, um, in source, but they tried to manage the situation, they tried to manage the flows in the European borders and in a way they create new borders. Um, within Europe. Um, I'm not sure if it will... Uh, it certainly affects uh, national politics throughout Europe. It does not affect... And it does uh, affect the rise of the far right in Europe. 
but specifically in Greece specifically it, it does not it doesn't play that huge of a role because we are in a pre-electoral uh, climate at the moment but migration and refugees are not a priority um, but it's something that it uh, it, it should become priority. It certainly, but I, what I would say to you, Marianne, is that perhaps this is not a political priority for the, the European Union in the run-up to these elections, uh, but this narrative is being harnessed by groups on the far right. This, uh, this uh, anti-immigration, anti-letting anti people in, keeping borders strong, keeping borders tight. Uh, do you think that th this is something that needs to be tackled first in order to deal uh, with uh, the, prob the, the, the wider problem of preventing internal displacement? Uh, or, or do you think the two can be tackled side by side? Uh, I think these narratives have to be tackled first by the democratic circle of uh, our political uh, um, of our political leaders. Uh, however, it is not okay. because the far right is using uh, migration uh, as one of the main. It's one of its main narratives, and I think this is one of the main reasons that Brexit happened. Okay. And I think that uh, the European leaders in each um, in, its, in each country did not pay that much attention to that and they should do it. I'm not sure if it, I'm not sure if it can happen side by side, but it, it should be a priority at the moment. Uh, Alexandre Bilek, what do you think the, the, the roadblocks are to tackling this? We do have this political problem. We do have this narrative, this anti-immigrant narrative in developing countries. We also see uh, there is a, a problem with climate change denial. Do you think that um, we need to tackle those? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's clear that um, the, the, the breakdown in international so solidarity has been made obvious when it comes to the refugee response uh, within uh, at the European level and in the US as well. But it's even more obvious when you look at the question of internal displacement. And in fact, many of the arguments that we've been making over the last 20 years, ever since we started reporting on this phenomenon, we started making arguments that were very much humanitarian arguments because we assumed that the that decent human beings should care about what is happening to other human beings uh, at the other side of the world. Unfortunately, we've seen that these uh, arguments have fallen on deaf ears uh, and have just simply not worked. So we have started actually now making a different kind of argument and changing the narrative about it so that we can mobilize as, as much political support as, as we think this uh, issue deserves. For example, when we are now talking, we have demonstrated clearly the links between unresolved internal displacement and cross-border movements. We're now also looking at the economic cost of internal displacement to countries and to regions. We mustn't underestimate what this displacement is going to mean for future generations of, of people and of countries themselves. As, as, uh, as children uh, are dropping out of school, uh, women are losing their employment prospects, the mental health impact as well of, of this phenomenon is, it sh should certainly not be overlooked. But there is, more importantly, a financial cost um, and, a, and a burden that rests on these states that will prevent them from uh, quite simply uh, reaching their objectives under the, the sustainable development goals that they've all committed to for 2030. So all these global policy agendas and policy frameworks that are out there from the SDGs to the Paris Agreement to the Sendai Framework on Disaster Risk Reduction and the new urban agenda are at risk of not being implemented if not sufficient, if insufficient political attention and financial resources um, are, 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 if sufficient resources are, are not uh, uh, put into, into the, 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 the root causes of these, uh, of these crises, which very much start at home in the countries of origin. OK, and I'm afraid we have uh, run out of time for this discussion. Many more topics to be uh, explored with this, I'm sure. We'll continue uh, the discussion online, but for my guests now, thank you so much. Uh, Alexandre Bilal, Bilek, François Gemin and Mariana Karakoulaki. Thank you to uh, you at home for watching. You can see the programme anytime uh, by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. The discussion, as we were saying, does continue online. Do head to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story or join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story.
or you can tweet me directly at Hallamothia Dean. Until next time, from me and the whole team, goodbye for now.